Yeah. What what just happened? <laughs> Juggernaut. I, I said the word juggernaut is in the title, and we're suddenly talking about Celtic words. <laughs> well, he mentioned bugaboo. Isn't that typical for this juggernaut podcast? That is typical, but I did not. I did not anticipate that. Anyway, welcome once again to Free Association from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast for anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as I am by when there will be new seasons of all of the television shows that I love. Did you guys, like me, binge watch absolutely everything during the pandemic, and mm-hmm. now there's nothing to watch? All mm-hmm. Creatures Great and Small Season 2. I don't even know what that one is. Should oh, I watch it, that? It's the latest adaptation of James Harriet's Soul Cre- Creatures Great and Small. Oh. It's really good. It's gentle and charming, and they have lovely people who are generally kind to each other. It's really actually kind of, like, soothing. Sounds good. I, I'm just waiting for the next season of Ted Lasso. And, oh, I love Ted Lasso. And all of the other... Same reason. It's gentle and soothing. And gentle, funny. Exactly. You're exactly right about that. All right. Well, I am Matt Fox from the Departments of Epidemiology and Global Health at the Boston University School of Public Health. And I am joined once again by Dr. Christopher Gill from the Department of Global Health. Welcome, Express Same to you. Mm-hmm. Isn't it? And Means I don't speak Dutch. I am... Oh, is that you're practicing for your yes, sabbatical? Yes, because I'm, I'm leaving in, in six days wow. for the Netherlands. Wow, but you're going to continue. This time next week, I will be in Utrecht. But you will be continuing this podcast virtually. From the Netherlands. That's right. Is it Utrecht or Utrecht? I think it's Utrecht. Okay. Utrecht. And I am also joined by... I hike in U- Utrecht. Doc. Have you? <laughs> Dude, what? That's I a... hike in Utrecht. Do you? No. No, that's oh, a... Ah! <laughs> I tried a third time, Chris. <laughs> I got it now. <laughs> That's brilliant. See, I'm going to try that one when I, I get to the say, Netherlands. You know he's going to use that. You know he's going to use that. All right. <laughs> that that is very good. I. I'm sorry, I'm a little slow. I am also oh. joined by Dr. Don Thea from the Department of Global Health. Welcome, Don. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> As a reminder, you can head on over to the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthex.org. BU's hub for this is where you can exchange your health, lifelong for learning. Health. If you could, that would be a huge benefit, I suppose. Also, head on over to your favorite podcast app and give us a rating. That really helps others find us. There's like Snitcher, uh, Snitcher. That's Snitcher. what it's called. Yeah, you find the snitches and or the snitches, the Starbelly snitches. All right, so now onto the show. So today in our first segment, which is our journal club, we are going to look at a study that got a ton of attention. Tons. A Tons. study on Epstein-Barr virus and multiple sclerosis. Then in the second part of the podcast, which is our deep dive, we'll talk about the Kennedy who built a COVID-19 misinformation juggernaut. Yay. That is the title of, a, of an article that we're going to be talking about. And then in our third segment, which is our amazing and amusing, we'll talk about the things that make us laugh out loud or... Just fascinated us. So, segment one. So we're going to talk about, as I said, an article that that's getting a ton of attention, I think for good reason, on this relationship between Epstein-Barr virus, which we will come back to. So it was published in Science, and it was titled, Analysis Reveals High Prevalence of Epstein-Barr Virus Associated with Multiple Sclerosis, by first author, Dr. I. I'm going to try to pronounce this, Teal Yornovich from the Department of Nutrition at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, right down the road from us here in Boston, Massachusetts. So some headlines. So this got a ton of headlines. I'm going to read you some. Multiple sclerosis and commonly found Epstein-Barr virus likely to be linked, major study says. That was from the Washington Post. The Hill says new evidence suggests Epstein-Barr virus triggers multiple sclerosis. MSN says... Warning over, quote, kissing virus that could cause debilitating condition. The New York Post says multiple sclerosis may be caused by common kissing disease virus, colon, scientists. And then the last one, which I just thought was interesting, that is... Colon scientists? Meaning, like, scientists, scientists said say, this thing. essentially. Yeah. Uh, and the last one, which I thought was, was interesting, that it is linked within this, because it isn't actually directly about the the study, but it is inspired by the study, which is a Forbes article, which says Moderna starts human trials of mRNA vaccine for virus that likely causes multiple sclerosis. So I mm. thought that was an interesting yeah. piece of information that follows for what we're going to talk about. So Don, you you are the one who originally pointed us in the direction of this study. 
Can you can you walk us through it? Sure, sure. I I found this to be absolutely a fascinating study, a fascinating approach, and potentially really important in terms of solving what has been a decades-long mystery in terms of what is causing multiple sclerosis. So let me let me talk first about multiple sclerosis. This is a this is a disease of unknown etiology up up until currently, which is characterized by demyelination of the central nervous system of the brain and the spinal cord. And what does that mean? When electrical impulses are conducted down nerves, they're conducted down axons, which are sort of wrapped in fat. And that fat allows the propagation of that signal to progress rather rapidly. And so with multiple sclerosis, the demyelination occurs as an autoimmune phenomenon, we think. But we don't know what the etiology, what, what, the, what the cause of that autoimmune process is. But basically, you're, you're, you're wiping the fat off of the axons, and you then get central nervous system dysfunction as a result. And it can be in the brain, it can be in the spinal cord, and it's a progressive, oftentimes progressive, lifelong disease with some medications that may arrest the development of it, but certainly there is no cure. And we don't know what has caused it, although a viral insult has long been postulated, and there's um, a whole bunch of sort of circumstantial evidence to suggest a number of different viruses, most notably Epstein-Barr. So Epstein-Barr has been sort of in the crosshairs for quite some time. Epstein-Barr virus is a herpes virus. It's a member of the herpes virus family, which is important because herpes viruses, once you are infected with them, live in you forever you don't get rid of them. So like the cold sores or genital herpes, herpes virus, live in the ganglion. Chicken pox. Chick and chicken pox. They, Cap they live, karma, like human herpes virus They eight, live in the nervous tissue and then occasionally come out. Same thing with Epstein-Barr virus, except it lives in the B cells. And it is virtually ubiquitous in the population. By the time you reach middle age, 95, 96, 98% of people have evidence of having had a prior infection. And it's also um, transmitted in saliva. So that's why it's called the kissing disease. And oftentimes, the age at which you first get infected is the age at which you first start kissing. So in any event, a multiple sclerosis, MS doesn't typically have an onset until 30s or 40s or 50s. So trying to figure out a relationship between a, an infection that occurs in the teens or early 20s with a disease that doesn't manifest until much later on is a really difficult pro problem. And so these researchers decided that they would look at what's considered to be a, an experiment of nature in that they wanted to look at a population of people for which there are a sufficient number of samples so that they can pick out these very rare events, which is the development of multiple sclerosis, in the sea of very common events, which is Epstein-Barr virus. Yep. So they went to the serum repository of the United States Department of Defense, wherein they have banked samples, blood samples, from all of the recruits, essentially, that have gone into the Army. I think it's 62 million samples in this repository. Whenever anybody serves in the military in the United States, typically it starts when your people start when they're 18 or in their early 20s, they get their screen for HIV. So there's a, a blood sample taken and that is banked. And then every two years they get additional blood taken. And there are some people that remain in the military for really quite a long period of time. So what they decided to do was to say, all right, Let's identify all of the people in the U.S. military that have developed multiple sclerosis, MS. Because if you develop MS, you become so debilitated that it is a cause for severing your, your connection with the, with the military. So the likelihood that the diagnoses are real are, are probably quite very good high. because it's, it's a very important mm -hmm. outcome for a particular service member. And, com and compare those outcomes with people who started off their military service without having been infected with Epstein-Barr virus. So, so they, they looked in the, in the repository and they came up with 955 cases of MS. And then they looked at the samples from those 955 people who had MS to see how many of them did not have Epstein-Barr virus infection when they entered the military at 20 years of age. And they found that there were about 801 cases who were Epstein-Barr virus negative upon entry into the military and 1,500 controls that were matched for age and sex and a whole bunch of other characteristics who were EBV negative. So among those 801 
cases who were EBV negative, they found 35 cases of multiple sclerosis and 107 controls who were EBV negative, as I said. And they also looked at blood samples that were obtained in between the outcome of MS and their, their baseline blood. And when they, they looked at, of those 35 who developed MS, all but one of them had evidence of an intercurrent Epstein-Barr virus infection. Whereas amongst the 107 controls who were EBV negative upon entering the, the service, only about 53% of them actually converted to, yeah. to EBV. And the rates of seroconversion, therefore, among the, the, the individuals that developed MS was 97%, and as I said, 57% among the controls. And when they did the, the, the analysis, that gave a hazard ratio of 32, which is a huge hazard ratio. Yeah. And then they addressed two other things that I thought were really interesting. They did the same analysis with CMV. And they found that there was absolutely no correlation. So you should explain so, why yeah, explain CMV is, well, is explain a, what CMV a, a good is. control. Right. So cytomegalovirus control. is a good control because it also is virtually ubiquitous in the population. And you typically you get infected early in life, typically in childhood. But certainly by the time you're in your 20s, uh, most people most people are and infected. And it's also a kissing virus. And it's, it's also, very similar to EBV. Yeah, it's also, yes, it's also transmitted by uh, exchange of saliva. So it's a really, really good Good, good marker. And it's a herpes virus. And it's a herpes virus. And they found nothing there. Nothing. No correlation whatsoever. And then they asked the question, all right, is there any indication of MS that occurs before the clinical onset when you be, begin to show weakness or, or imbalance in your, in your gait or your station? And this is something that I was not aware of, but apparently there is a biomarker that occurs in the blood years prior to when you develop MS. It's called neurofilament light chain. And it's basically parts of that wrapping of the axons that gets broken down and it can be measured in the blood. Mm -hmm. And they ask the question of those individuals during the period before they got infected with EBV and after they got infected with EBV, if they were controls, was, was there any evidence of this biomarker? And essentially there wasn't. But for all of those people who went on to develop MS, they didn't show evidence of this biomarker until after they became infected with Epstein-Barr virus. Mm -hmm. So that further shows that there is a, at least a temporal relationship between Epstein-Barr virus infection and the development of clinical MS. I thought that that was really interesting and, and a really interesting way to imply that there's not reverse causation here, which is always the bugaboo of, of, of studies like this. Then the last thing that they did was they, they, they employed a test called the VIR scan, which I was also unfamiliar with, but apparently what they have done is they have created a bank of peptides that correlates with certain segments of the genome of 200 viruses known to infect humans. And they scanned the blood on these individuals to look to see whether any of these viruses correlated with the outcome in addition to Epstein-Barr. And in this assay, whether it was adenovirus or metanumavirus or influenza virus, out of 200, the only one that highly correlated with this outcome in this assay was Epstein-Barr virus. Yeah. So, I mean, it, 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 it really was a very elegant way of looking at this problem from a number of different ways and in a, in a, in a really unique approach to a data set. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, it's really interesting study. I think there's so much to talk about here, but I'll just say up front, I, I, I think this is, this is really tremendous work, even though I have some questions about certain things, but I, 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 I buy this and I, I, I'm really impressed with what they've done. Chris, uh, same. what's your thoughts? Same. No, I thought it was, it was terrific science. I love the word elegant. I think it's, this is, this is like Truly our highest elegant. praise. This yeah. is a brilliant bit of, uh, of analysis. So well done team over at Harvard, T.H. Chan and other places. So I had nothing beyond what Don had described. I thought your, your, your summary of this was really, uh, really spot on, Don. I wanted to, to draw an interesting parallel because this, this natural experience was facilitated through this sort of the, the systematic 
fact of the U.S. military. And, and I just wanted to draw a historical parallel between how this played out and the evolution of our understanding of the mechanisms of bacterial meningitis and the immune protections against bacterial meningitis. So, you know, bacterial meningitis is very rare. It's caused by this, this organism called Neisseria meningitidis. It's a very, very rare infection, like 0.5 cases per 100,000 infants per year. And if you get out of, out of infancy, it's even more unusual. So it's like impossible to do a randomized controlled trial of this. And so you need a surrogate marker in vaccine development in order to, to license this vaccine. And that came about in 1969 because of something that was systematically going on in the U.S. population in 1969, which we all remember because we didn't want to go there, which was the Vietnam War. Okay. Right. And so people were being drafted in these cohorts of 10, 20, 30,000 young men brought in all around the country and put into barracks. And pretty much like, you know, with metronomic regularity, there would be outbreaks of bacterial meningitis in the, in the boot camps. And so this um, scientist, uh, Erwin Goldschneider, made this, this observation that there's a, there appears at a population level to be an inverse relationship between the incidence of bacterial meningitis by age and the presence or absence of this particular kind of antibody called bactericidal antibodies that are specific to different groups of meningitis. And so based on that hypothesis, he tested this in the military recruits in exactly the same way that they did here, oh. which is everybody came in, they rolled up their sleeve, they gave a tube of blood, and they were able then to follow them because they knew proof positive where these guys were going to be for the next eight weeks because they couldn't leave, right? And so they just waited to see who got meningitis and then went back and pulled the tubes out of the freezer and you know, like with almost no exception, none of these guys had, had bactericidal antibodies. Mm -hmm. And so that led to the, the use of this biomarker as a substitute, you know, leading to licensure of the vaccines. Every meningitis vaccine has been licensed based on the presence or absence of bactericidal antibodies, mm -hmm. as opposed to changes in disease rates at a population level, because the disease is too rare to study that way. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was, it was just like, you know, here's another example of where the U.S. military probably is sitting on gold mines of, of information. Yeah. And I just wonder, like, what else could you do with this? This, yeah. this, you know, construct. It's yeah. so valuable. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. So I've got a couple of points that I, I, I was, that came up. I mean, I have, I could talk about this for forever, but the question becomes, as you said, Don, this is not totally new information in the sense that this was hypothesized for a while now. And there is some evidence prior to this. The question is, why has this question not been answered before? And part of it, you know, is, as you say, Chris, there was this data set that was perfect for being able to do this in. But I think the other reason is the near ubiquity of exposure to this particular virus. That, right. that what, something like 90... 90... 95% of us have it by the time we, uh, you know, we get out of our 20s. And that makes it really difficult to establish effects. So the, there's a, there's a, there are several famous examples of you know, diseases that are 100% caused by a gene-environment interaction. I think in in chickens there's something called yellow shank, huh. which is a which is a, a condition that is caused by a genetic factor. You have to have the gene in order to develop it, but then you, you need the trigger. You get it from also then consuming yellow corn feed. I think it, I, I probably have the specifics wrong. Mm. If you take a population in which every chicken has the gene, you can manipulate the you can see the effects of the corn. Because chickens who consume the corn will develop the outcome and chickens who don't won't. But you cannot look at the effects of the gene because everybody has the gene. Mm -hmm. If you go to a population where the gene is, is varied, some have it and some don't, but you give every chicken the, the yellow corn, you're going to see the effects of the corn and not the gene. So there has to be something else going on because everybody, pretty much everybody gets Epstein-Barr virus. Most people do not develop MS. And so there's got to be other factors that are going right. on. And you could study those other factors if you had any idea of what they might be. And you could you could do that study you know, fairly easily. But you can't do the study of Epstein-Barr compared to no Epstein-Barr very easily because it's very hard to find people who are not exposed to Epstein-Barr or who never become infected with Epstein-Barr. Right. And, and here they, 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 they kind of point to the argument here by, by noting that, that there's, an, you know, the strongest, the current strongest known risk factor for MS is the to be HLA. homozygote for the HLA DR15 allele, which is a, a, a cell surface marker that sort of defines, is, is, you know, we use for like matching on organ transplants, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. And so this particular genotype 
plus the Epstein-Barr virus, seems to be maybe playing a little bit of the same role as the chicken gene and the feed exposure. There's an ubiquitous exposure, but there are certain high-risk individuals who will react differently to this exposure. And it also appears that there's some delay, because when you look at the time course in this study, the, 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 the time from exposure approximately, because they, you know, they're looking every two years. And so it's, you know, the, the teeth of the comb are pretty far apart. Nonetheless, it, it appears that there's a, there's a very delayed onset of MS relative to the exposure to EBV of, you know, years. And in our last podcast, we talked about like the difficulty in, in associating cervical cancer vaccines with cervical cancer outcomes is challenging because there's a delay of 10 years mm -hmm. or longer. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little bit the same thing that this is another challenge to showing cause and effect is that it's not like you get EBV and next week you get multiple sclerosis, then it would be obvious. But here you got to wait five years and, and track them out. And it's so hard to do that. V very hard to do that. So that gets to a, it gets to a second point, which is, so, so you said the, the odds ratio or the hazard ratio was somewhere like 32, right? Big. If, if Epstein-Barr virus is a necessary condition, in other words, you can't develop MS without Epstein-Barr, if that were the case, and I'm not saying that is the case. Then in theory, it should be, you know, an infinite hazard ratio, hazard ratio right? Uh, there should be nobody who gets MS if they don't have Epstein-Barr. And some percentage of people who get Epstein-Barr will also develop MS. And so the, the ratio is going to be much larger than 32. I mean, it's going to be, you have nothing to compare it to because there should be no cases, mm -hmm. right? So... It seems to me one of a couple of things are going on. One is that we we're just got some measurement error, some misinformation, and people are just not perfectly classified either with respect to most likely with respect to Epstein Barr. Well, MS also, but possibly also with it's respect a to diagnosis. MS. There's exactly. no real good surefire laboratory test for MS. Exactly. So, so could be that there is some misclassification of you know one of those two key variables, or. This is not the only cause. Right. But there could be other. Oh yeah, I think yeah, that that's, 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 that that's a, that's sort of accepted. That yeah. it's not just a manifestation of EBV. Yeah. It's probably a manifestation of EBV and this this HLA so, 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 Sorry, I, I was I, fair enough, and you're right, right about that. I was I was suggesting a, could could there potentially be another viral infection? Yeah, and they draw that could also lead to the same outcome, and it's just not as common. They, they, they draw Absolutely. a, a Absolutely. parallel to yeah. that with like, you know, acute flaccid paralysis right. as being, yeah. you know, predominantly yeah. caused by polio, but it's not just polio. It's other, you know, enteroviruses in the polio virus family exactly. that do this, but at a much, much, much lower rate. And so like, you know, paradoxically, one of the, you know, one of the sort of quality control checks to see if, if you know, countries are truly reporting their, their polio, their acute flaccid paralysis rates accurately is if they're, if they're claiming zero cases, it can't be true because polio vaccine only reduces polio cases. And on the other enteroviruses, the Coxsackie viruses mm -hmm. and the echoviruses should still be causing acute flaccid paralysis at some basal rate. And so if you don't see that, it's probably because the data are cooked. Yep. So, yep, yep, yep. It was interesting because in the supplementary materials, they, they, they give a timeline of all 35 cases when the antecedent blood was was drawn, when it became positive from that negative baseline. And in the that one case that did not uh, did not become positive. This that, is the one this, out of 35, right? The one out of 35 yep. that was not EBV positive. The last sample was taken, according to this timeline, almost immediately before the MS was diagnosed in this individual. And they didn't they didn't say whether that person had evidence of this light chain this biomarker or not, but it could that 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 could easily be a misdiagnosis yep. of MS in that in that instance yep. because because there was virtually no time between a negative EBV test and the the onset of the clinical disease. Yep, yep. All right, that's right. So maybe another virus, or maybe the lab was wrong and the person yeah. really was positive, or maybe there's another trigger out there that occurs at a lower rate. But this is but this is great incremental science because oh, it's now yeah. because phenomenal. now we can really really think smartly and focus on EBV plus whatever right. else. And so it's going to, it's going to narrow the, the, the field tremendously. Right. And I, I thought it was interesting. They say at the end that, you know, the main therapy, the most effective therapy is a monoclonal antibody for MS that depletes memory B cells, right? right. But memory B cells are important. Right. You don't want to deplete them if you don't have to, because they like protect you from dying of other stuff like 
COVID, for example. But and it's so, interesting because that's the reservoir for EBV. But that's where the reservoir is for EBV. So it totally makes sense that this would work against of against course. EBV. Yeah. But it also says, well, like if it's if it's EBV, then maybe we should be treating EBV rather than the T cells that are infected with EBV. And maybe that would work as well too. So I think this opens up to you or, know a question or, of antiviral or prevent EBV in or the first place. Or a vaccine, place. like a you vaccine. said, yeah. or a vaccine. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. And you you wonder whether we are you know we're in the early stages now of looking at the the change in cervical cancers that that we have now seen due to HPV vaccination. You know, you know it's so interesting because we we talked at length at, uh, in our last uh, episode about uh, the problems of vaccine acceptance and 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 considering how those problems are now on steroids because of COVID, and how we're kind of because of HPV and the HPV vaccine and cervical cancer now possibly an EBV vaccine and MS. We're at a point where vaccines are showing tremendously additional promise. But we are at, also at the, same in a, in a, in a, at the same time, we're fostering all this hesitancy and working against ourselves. And it's, it's really, it really, it's deeply disturbing. It is deeply disturbing. So let's, let's segue in then into segment two, because that is what segment two is about. I did which that is, well. You did that incredibly well. <laughs> it's almost as if you'd planned it. <laughs> where we wanted to talk about this article, I believe it was in the New York Times, right? No, sorry, Boston Globe, which was entitled How a Kennedy Built an Anti-Vaccine Juggernaut Amid COVID-19 by Michelle Smith. And this this article details Children's Health Defense, which is the organization that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. heads. And it, it's it's a, I mean, we, we were discussing earlier whether or not it is truly a juggernaut, but, but they say that they have filings with charity regulators show their revenue more than doubled in 2020 to 6.8 million. But this is an organization that has dedicated itself seemingly to spreading a lot of misinformation about vaccines, in particular in recent times, spreading a lot of misinformation around the COVID vaccines. And, you know, this was an organization that was around prior to COVID, was doing a lot of work spreading misinformation about vaccines in general, but COVID comes along and they take advantage of the opportunity, as have many other groups. But this one in particular is interesting in that it's gotten so many, so much attention. And it is also linked back to the a member of the Kennedy family giving it a lot of high profile attention. And he was say. The, the nephew of John F. Kennedy, president nephew of, John F. of John F. Kennedy, son of Robert. Robert Kennedy. And, you know, built this large organization spreading a, a substantial amount of misinformation. As I said, the the article demo, you know talks about the fact that they have they have substantially increased the amount of funds that they have been able to raise in relation to COVID nineteen. Now, presumably, that is that is a causal relationship that COVID nineteen is the reason why they have been able to massively increase their funding and also increase the traffic that is coming to their website and learning information from them. Kennedy has has written books about Tony Fauci. Lots of of information that is, I would say, harmful misinformation. The question I, I have for you guys is why? Why? I mean, what is and, and and you know this is specifically about Kennedy, but but what is the motivation in general for all of these organizations that have dedicated themselves to spreading misinformation about vaccines in general, but let's be specific to COVID. Let me, yeah. let me, let me quote one, one sentence Go from for the it. article. According to tax filings, Kennedy was paid $255,000 by Children's Health Defense in 2019. And so you are, in, you are from that inferring, I assume, that the reason is money. I think two hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars is a lot of money. Is it a lot of money for a Kennedy? Yeah, I. I, I this is why I, I, I think was it's a sub- lot of money for anybody. I don't know. I, I've been watching su- Succession if, lately. Well, wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait a second. If if it if the money is not the motivation for Kennedy, because Kennedy has so much family money, why isn't he taking no salary? Why is he taking two hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars? Okay, so your 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 point being that if. If it was truly just about a, a belief in helping people, in his view, that he wouldn't be taking any money yeah. because he doesn't need it, and therefore, well, that was your it would that, be that he doesn't need it because he's Kennedy and they have family money. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't. I didn't mean to say he didn't need it so much as I, I'm not sure. Money is the only motivation. I suspect it more than 
maybe more, maybe more than isn't the right term, but but certainly weighs in there heavily is is ego. That when I look at you know how much of this, how many of the the people who seem to be very focused on spreading misinformation, so much of it seems to me to be about being able to be the one with the information that nobody else has, and we, you know, we we understand the uh, truth, and you're missing it, and you are. You are very much in disagreement with it. Yeah, I'm very, no, I'm very much yeah, in disagreement your... with it because I think that I, I can't think of the specifics now, but there are a number of purveyors of misinformation, particularly about vaccines. And, and there was an article I, uh, recently that uh, where they looked at the various we uh, websites on social and social media um, posts, and it boils down to about 15 people who who are responsible for, for about 75 percent of the vaccine misinformation. Yeah, yeah, I remember Kennedy, seeing that. Kennedy was one of them. Yeah. And when you dug deeper, you found that a lot of those people had websites, and they were selling alternative medicine yeah. products. Yeah, but I agree. And I couldn't they were find making... that on this one, though. Sorry, I couldn't on their website, the CHD website. I could not find that they were selling. You know, they're, they, they were selling T-shirts and baseball caps, basically. And they're making 6.8 million dollars. Well, in I know, but they're getting it from fundraising. Those are but donations. I, I don't think, like you know, you mentioned. We, we talked in the in the break between the two segments. We talked about Alex Jones and in Infowars. Infowars yeah. right. and he was he pulling was in like a lot of money. On so, 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 so maybe you didn't happen to find the particular place where right. the maybe it's somewhere else. Where, maybe somewhere else. But I think with respect to these other sources of misinformation, there is a clear correlation with there being purveyors of alternative. Yeah, I get that. Herbal yep. medicines and 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 various other things. So I think profit motive. Um, is 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 absolutely deeply at, at play here, Chris. What about you? I, I I was you know I started with that assumption too, and I was that's what I was looking for when I was searching the website last night to try to understand like how the website you know would generate profit, and you know they have an online fundraising portal and things like that, but it doesn't sound like I mean if, to me six point eight million dollars sounds like a lot of money, but that's because I work, I'm a professor at BU, right, and so I, I'm one of the the little people here, and I I, I imagine. That, that, you know, even if the Kennedy, you know, fortune has been sliced and diced over the generations and subdivided across larger and larger numbers of descendants, even so, I think these, these you know, for these people, they probably have a lot of money and $250,000 in salary doesn't sound much. And yet, if you had the option of like giving, taking $250,000 and not taking $250,000. take it. Even if you were multimillionaire, I think you would probably still say, I would take it. Thank right, you. Right. But but I agree that there, it feels like there's something else here. And it's either it's either a cynical profit motive like like Alex Jones or he's a true believer. Or, or you weren't able to find the primary site in an ecosystem that is associated with Child's Health Defund. Yeah, right. that's entirely possible. You know, I mean, it's oftentimes entirely possible. there are many other places and, 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 and there's a lot of sort, sort of self-reinforcement okay. across, across these portals. Fair enough. All right, so my second question is, what's gonna happen when, to vaccination when COVID goes away? Because it seems to me that what COVID has done is it has laid the foundations for these groups to get a huge audience that doesn't go away once COVID goes away. And, you know, vaccines are incredibly important and vaccine hesitancy was growing before the pandemic. What's going to happen to childhood vaccination rates when this is all over? So it's a very interesting question. And I, I was thinking about this actually in our in the review of the paper we did for the last episode, which was looking at the VAERS reports, where there was a sort of spike in, in you know, parent-driven adverse events reporting, which were mainly around autism spectrum-like syndromes. Yep. And, the you know, there was a, you know, we, we couldn't infer cause and effect in that analysis. It was just it was just too distant between the stimulus and the response. And and yet we I think we came away thinking that there was plausibly a relationship. Yep. At any rate, the rise in parent driven adverse events reporting in that paper was very brief. Yep. It was only like a year or so and then went back down to baseline. So I, you know, the, the part of me thinks that perhaps after all the the hysteria and the the hyper focus, the unprecedented focus on vaccines, driven by the COVID epidemic. Eventually, COVID will you know will go away, or at least it'll become something that we don't obsess about it you know all day long. And then I kind of like part of me hopes that that people will just kind of relax a little bit, and the the intensity around vaccine, the vaccine debate will will start to shift. But 
Hope, I, yes. I can see fingers yeah. going up. Yeah, yeah. Hope, yeah. Yes. I know, hope, I know, hope, I know. Yes. Hope is not is not a plan. But I disagree. I, yeah. I disagree. I think you think this is permanent. In, I think there's I incalculable too. damage being done, especially with respect to to vaccine mandates. Vaccine mandates is such Absolutely. a lightning rod at this point, with respect to parents and also with respect to schools. Never before, really, to any any great not like this. No, nothing has, like this. Has vac the mandate that your child needs to be up to date on their vaccinations in order to be able to go to public school has been a problem. And I think going forward, it is going to be a problem for a, a, a years to come. And I think it's going to be so conflated with this, this political tribalism that it's, you know, like critical race theory, which is not being taught in any of these schools, has become a, you know, a, 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 a really organizing influence is, is, is our destiny for decades. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with Don on this. I mean, Chris, I, I do think you're right in that it's going gonna, it's gonna to die down a bit. It's certainly not going to be as pronounced as what you're seeing with the, the movements against vaccine mandates for COVID. But I think there's there is extremely likely to be a knock on effect from what's happening now to childhood vaccination rates going forward, simply because people have become so much more have gotten used to the idea of pushing back against a vaccine mandate. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, it, it's not going to be people aren't going to feel as strongly about it as they feel about the covid vaccines, because those are, in their view, experimental and brand new. But I, the idea that that vaccines, you know, cause great damage, which is the message that these folks are selling, and many people are buying, mm -hmm. is uh, you know I don't think you can you can just walk away from that. I and predict, not feel I, predict the repercussions. You, I predict that the amount of homeschooling is going to start increasing tremendously. It certainly could. And I think a sort of non-vaccine mandate charter schools are also going to start increasing. Non oh. That, that, that well, schools... people organize themselves around charter schools that are based on on not having to get vaccinated. Is that a, is that a is that a, a, charter schools are public schools, right? Well, they're 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 special schools organized around specific principles using public funds. Yeah, I don't I, I, I that's unclear to me, but but I would imagine private schools and private schools certainly. certainly. Yeah, yeah. Boy, well, it, it it causes me great concern for the future because I think there is a lot mm. of damage being done. Mm. All right, let's move on to our last segment, which is our amazing and amusing. Don, you wanna you wanna go first this yeah, time? Yeah, yeah. Let me go first. And Good, what I, want... I can't I can't find mine. And I'm digging around <laughs> okay. while I'm stalling. All right. What I what I wanted to do was to elaborate on what I talked about last time in my third segment about natural language processing. Mm -hmm. How previously okay. it was how the translation software had mangled these phrases, these tortured phrases, yep. and indicated sources of plagiarism in the scientific literature. But I, I want to just give a few examples of some of the text that these natural language processing software can do. And as one example, they gave one of these algorithms the task of, of writing a poem. Mm. And the poetry assignment was this. Write a poem from the point of view of a cloud looking down on two warring cities. Mm. The clever student poet turned in the following rhyming poem, meaning... Clever student poet being a computer. Correct. I think I'll start to rain because I don't think I can stand the pain of seeing you two fighting like you do. That's really good. A computer <laughs> wrote that. The computer wrote that in relation to the assignment that was just given. Better than I could have done. <laughs> so, wow. Tell me, tell mm, me honestly that you, <laughs> tell me honestly that you believe that fifty years from now, computers aren't going to be able to do our jobs for us after you read that. Oh, I totally do. They, they, I totally do. They're going to be able to find the data. On the way, you know, on the they're, internet, they're, it's all going to be interconnected. They're going to be able to figure out causation better than we can. Absolutely. And we are not going to have a job. But, well, not, I, but not quite yet. Okay. Let me, let me give all a couple right. more examples. The, the computer was tasked with the goal of writing satirical dictionary definitions of science and academia by prompting it with eight examples, such as rigor. And the computer came up with something for scientists to aspire to, a state of mind that would not be required if scientists could be trusted to do their job. <laughs> oh, dear. That doesn't sound very good for us. <laughs> uh, now, That's the, what it learned. The literature. 
a name given to other people's published papers referred to by scientists without actually reading them. <laughs> oh, dear. Got us banged to rights on that one. <laughs> totally did. <laughs> Scientist, noun. A person who has a laboratory, access to large sums of money, graduate students, or all three. Whoa. Wow. Do we have access to large sums of money? Uh, yeah. No, but graduate students. We have, we have graduate, graduate students. students. Scientist, a field based on science devoted to completing works for which there will not be enough time in a single lifetime. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Two more. Track record. When scientists use this term, they refer to the research done by someone else, usually a student, in order to <laughs> avoid having to do research. That sounds about right. Oh, dear. And the last one is faculty. Used, oh, boy. I'm used worried about loosely that. by scientists to mean any group of people with advanced degrees, typically used when you have done something stupid and want to inform <laughs> others that it wasn't you who did it, the but rather faculty did it. those other crazy <laughs> the faculty people did it. over there who put their titles after their names. Oh, that's got it. Oh. Isn't that amazing? That's, that is incredible. I'm worried about the future. I'm really worried about the future. Or maybe I should be happy about it. I don't know, but... I, st I don't think we have jobs in the future. And apparently they're, go they're, they're, they're like doing legal research. They're going, they're going through legal opinions and they're writing briefs. It's, it's scary. It's really scary. Wow. Well, I don't have any marketable skills anymore, so I, I, I'm just waiting to be sunset. Yep. Chris, <laughs> I, what do you got? You know, as people have probably heard me say a couple times, I'm about to go on sabbatical to the University of Utrecht what? in the Netherlands, and I'll be gone all this year. Is news to me. So I'll, I'll still be uh, hosting in just from a different time zone. It'll be like when you were in London. Yep. Anyway, I, I thought it would be uh, helpful. So you're going to give us the history of Utrecht? No, I'm going mean, to. I just found this website which gives 38 fun facts about right. Utrecht. Fun facts and, about Utrecht. And the truth is that I found that like 80% of these were not that fun. Okay, good. So I'm not going so to read, I'm not gonna read them all. To us. But I, 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 a couple of them I thought were interesting, which was that there was the only Dutch pope was from Utrecht. I didn't know there was a Dutch pope. I didn't who know was there was. It, which it one? was Pope Adrianus the Sixth, who was pope from 1522 until 1523. Okay, I have so to admit he, I don't. He keep didn't good have track much of... impact. We will assume there was a tower in the in Utrecht, which is the highest church tower in the Netherlands, which is the Dom Tower, and it is 49 meters tall and it has 14 clocks. That's a lot of clocks. That's a lot of clocks. The clocks alone weigh 32,000 kilos. If you were wondering, that's I, some pretty, pretty uh, heavy time there. I was wondering. That people who live in Utrecht are called tea swallowers, tea schlickers. I don't know how to pronounce it in, in Dutch, but it's because they tend to drop their teas. When oh, they talk. Tea <laughs> so the local dialect is, is tealess. Do they drop so their I think teas that means they're really into coffee. Drop their teas and lift their eyes? The, probably something like that. This, I think, was really cool. That the biggest bicycle parking lot in the world is in Utrecht, which has spots for 12,500 bicycles. Seems like a reason alone to go. That is a lot of that is a lot of bicycles. It goes way back into ancient history and the the fact that, uh, oh, this is very important and I think Don will appreciate one, is that beer gets delivered to restaurants and cafes by, by canal on, <laughs> on boats. That's wonderful. That is wonderful <laughs> That news. is so helpful to know. It is an old city and it got its name from a Roman fortress. In Roman times, there was a fortress located at the current site of Utrecht. This fortress was, was called Tri Triacetum, or Tri Triectum, triectum. I can't pronounce it right, because it's location at the Rhine River. And triectum is translated into Dutch as tracht. Triectum, tracht. And the U comes from Ut in Dutch, which means downriver. So it's the downriver fort, Utrecht. Who knew? Well, I, there you go. So I certainly did not know. Fertile ground for the next Jeopardy. You know, you know, Chris, <laughs> some people think that your amazing amusings are kind of just random. They are. But I think they are whatever you happen to be looking at on your computer before you came over here. And I think at one some point you are just going to read us your grocery list. <laughs> That's what I think is going to happen. All right. Well, mine is a short one. And if you're wondering, it's not because I can only find the abstract and left the paper in my office. That is not the reason. I'm keeping it short there intentionally. Are other reasons? No. So this, I don't know if you guys came across this paper in Travel Medicine and Infectious Diseases. No. It was entitled No Time to Die, an in-depth analysis of James Bond's exposure to infectious yes, one agents. Of my, one of my students presented this in class. This yeah. is brilliant. So some so so these folks went through <laughs> all of it's the hysterical. James Bond movies 
3,113 minutes of evening hours per author. Three authors. <laughs> watching all of these movies and going through and categorizing all of the different potential infectious disease exposures that James Bond would have had. You know, things, obviously, there's the the sexually transmitted disease yeah, ones. Um, <laughs> then there's, like, you know, the not washing your hands kind of thing. Because after you these, kill someone with your bare hands, you should wash your hands. Exposure to to, to blood and all of those things. To, to me, the, the interesting part is not the specifics of what they found. They did, of course, in their... Analysis find that there were a lot of different potential exposures that one could have while, you know, traveling internationally and conducting James Bond type escapades. To me, the more interesting part is just that somebody <laughs> commits that much time to something, you know, to, you know, to get your paper into the travel medicine and infectious disease journal, or in our case, to get something into the BMJ Christmas edition. Right. I just, I admire people who commit <laughs> to something that sounds like a funny idea or a good idea and then are willing to commit thousands of hours to actually going through and watching all of the James Bond movies and writing this down. I just, you know. Well, like, like, like doing a series of experiments and <laughs> comparing. Marmite to Vegemite? Correct. The Chris Buell <laughs> Marmite Vegemite. But that did not, I, I presume that, that did not take day. you. Yeah, I was going to say, that did not take you thousands of hours. No. Like, this is. One of the things that I remember from that article was that they 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 counted the number of times that James Bond appeared with a liquid in his hand, and apparently yes. twenty five percent of the time it was a non alcoholic beverage. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't remember that because part. I think it was it was it was not just infectious disease risks that he was taking. It was sort of public health risks. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. He was taking. So were his other and he beverages? rarely wore a seatbelt. That was the other, yeah. He never he almost never wore a seatbelt. But of course it was you know in the seventies nobody wore a seatbelt, right? Yeah, that's true. Oh my goodness. So anyway. That was hysterical. Kudos to it. them for committing to the bit. All right. So that is the end of our program. If you got any feedback or this or any other episode or you want to suggest a study or a topic to take on, you can tweet us at at PopHealthEx or me at at PropMattVox or Don at at one or Chris at ID.Gill or you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthex.org. We want to thank Leslie Talali and Assistant Dean of Lifelong Learning at the BU School of Public Health for supporting the podcast and Nick Guler for sound and editing. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you will download our next episode. <laughs>